This evening, uh, we're continuing to look at how we are to live a life that's glorifying to God, how we can devote ourselves to Him. And we're doing that by looking at the, uh, the Ten Commandments. So I'd like to read for you the Fourth Commandment. It comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Would you listen carefully as I read this? This is God's word. The Lord says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servants, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, we're, we're looking at the subject of how we can live a life that is wholly devoted to the Lord. And let's again review why it is we should want to live such a life. Now certainly we've already talked about the love which the Lord has shown to us in giving us His Son. We saw a great illustration of that this morning, as I've already made mention in my prayers that when our Lord Jesus Christ was given a view of what it is that he was being called to do by his Father, as he was spending time praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did pray, if it's possible that this cup would pass, realizing that this cup of suffering couldn't pass unless he drinks it down. The Lord Jesus purposed to do that because he loved his Father and because he loved us, those of us who had put our trust in him. Now that love certainly calls us to give ourselves to the Lord. Now certainly the example of Jesus Christ is the second reason he actually calls us to follow his example. And as our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself to do the will of the Father, we should do the same. But thirdly, we don't want to overlook the fact that if we have truly received the grace of God, if we are Christians, that we love the Lord and we want to do these things that he calls us to do. It's in our heart, it's in our nature now to do this. And it's certainly not difficult to do the things that you want to do. It's only difficult to do the things you don't want to do, but the Lord has given to us the want to in our hearts if we have received his grace. So as we look at these commandments, we should uh, see that we already have in our hearts the desire to do this. It should not be difficult for us. All we really need is the instruction on how it is the Lord would have us to honor him. We should then receive that and seek to apply it because that is, in fact, what we want to do. So we've seen so far that the commandments really do call us to do this. The first commandment calls us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength, to give our whole selves to Him, to love Him most of all, because He is worthy. The Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall love me most of all. The second commandment, of course, has to do with how we are to worship the Lord. He would not have us to worship Him through images, but rather that we would worship Him the way that He commands. And by the way, we, we saw that that applies not just to the way we worship as we're together, you know, more narrowly. But it also applies to how we would worship the Lord with our whole lives. The Lord calls us in loving Him to give our whole selves to Him and to do everything that we do for His glory. We are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. So we are to look to God as that which we love the most, as that which is our, our highest possible good, as that which thrills our hearts and our souls, and we are to surrender our, life, our lives to Him, to be His and His only in everything that we do, to serve Him as He would be served from the point that we are saved by His grace throughout really the rest of time, not just this life, but even that which is to come. Now, we began to look last week at how it is the Lord does want us to serve Him. And we saw that in the third commandment, 
the first way that we are to do this, and that is by not doing certain things. The Lord tells us that we are not to use His name as a common swear word, that we are not to accuse Him of anything evil, that we are not to call Him to bear witness to something that we say that we're going to do when we really have no intention on doing it, or to say that something is true or that something is false when we know that that is really not the case. To put this positively, the Lord tells us that we are to use His name respectfully, that we are to speak about Him respectfully, that we are to keep the promises that we make, and we are to say only those things that we believe to be true. Now, this evening we're going to look at the next thing that He tells us as to how we are to love Him, honor Him, and serve Him for the salvation that He has provided for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is by remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So what I would like us to do this evening is consider three things. First of all, why there is a Sabbath. Secondly, why we believe the Sabbath continues into the new covenant. And then thirdly, how we are to honor the Lord on the Sabbath day. Now, this is a lot of ground to cover, so we're just going to look at each of these things briefly. So first of all, let's consider, why is there a Sabbath day? Well, the Lord actually gives us the reason for the Sabbath in the commandment itself when He says in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, this scripture tells us that the Sabbath exists because God rested after His work of creation. And one thing we need to remember is that the word Sabbath actually means to rest. It means to cease. When God had finished creating everything that He had made in those six days, He ceased from creating. By that, we don't understand that God was tired because He doesn't get tired. He didn't need a rest, but it simply meant that he was finished with the work that he had done. Now, I just want to do one quick aside here, and simply this, that if we were to ask the question, why did God actually take six days to create something that he could have created with a word, that he could have created instantly, the answer is simply this, that God did this to establish for us a cycle of work and rest. That's the reason why we observe a seven-day week today. The reason why we are to work six days and rest on the seventh is because God created in six days and He rested on the seventh. And as another aside, let me just mention this, and this, this all, except perhaps for this, uh, feeds into this sermon a little bit further down the line. But why do we believe that God took six days to create and not 6,000, let's say, days or years or six million years? Why do we believe that God created all that He made in six days of what we would say essentially ordinary length and not six long periods of time? Why do we believe the Lord didn't create the heavens and the earth in six uh, analogous days? And maybe some of you who are aware of some of the debates, know what I'm talking about there, that God describes to us the creation in ways that are analogous to things we can understand but weren't really like that, or why we don't believe that God described His creation in a framework of literary days, or as the framework hypothesis uh, tells us, that these days actually could have been instantaneous or could have stretched on to millions of years. It's because of the commentary that the Lord gives to us in this particular passage on how long these days of Genesis 1 actually were. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore you are to work six days and rest on the seventh. There are those who look into Genesis 1 and they see that perhaps these days are just symbolic or they're literary or they're analogous and that God somehow is speaking in symbolic language. Well, I don't think that that's what He's doing in Genesis 1, but I do think very clearly here He is speaking in language that we can understand. 
God created in six days. This is his commentary on Genesis 1. What were those days? Well, the same kind of days that we understand as days. Now, the Lord knew that as creatures, we are not the creator, of course. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't evolve out of the dust. We're not cosmic accidents, but we're creatures that we would need two things. We would need rest, a day of rest, from the labors that we need to take care of our bodies. And secondly, as creatures, we would need a day to worship. We would need to worship the one who created us because that is what we owe him. That's why the Lord actually blessed the seventh day, the day on which he rested and sanctified it, why he set it apart from the other days is that it might be a common day of rest for all his creatures, and that really includes every, every uh, animal that would, that would work, that would labor, and that it would be a common day of worship for man. We do need to realize that God uh, gave this day to us, and he meant it for our good. This is not to be a burden to us, but something that would be good for us, a day to rest and a day to worship. Jesus says in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It was made for us to be a blessing. So again, God rested and sanctified uh, that day of his rest in order that we may have a common day of rest and a common day to worship him for the good of our bodies and the good of our souls. This day is for us. Now, secondly, why do we believe that the Sabbath continues into the new covenant? Again, while there are many churches that believe it doesn't. Well, we believe this for several reasons. First of all, has, have things changed now that we don't need rest any longer? I mean, has, has God changed our nature in the new covenant so that we can work seven days a week and we can uh, devote ourselves entirely to things that might normally wear us out? Are we now sort of... Uh, uh, beyond fatigue? I, I don't think so. Uh, the need for rest still exists. That hasn't really changed. If you worked all the time, then you would likely uh, shorten your life because we were not made to work all the time. Your body needs rest, not just the eight hours of sleep that you get or however many hours you happen to get uh, every night. You need a day to rest from all your work, to cease and to refresh your body. Otherwise, you will weaken it. Otherwise, you will get sick eventually. Otherwise, you will die prematurely. Well, secondly, our need for worship hasn't changed. In the new covenant, does the Lord say you no longer have to worship me? You no longer need to get together to worship me? No. God is still God. You are still creatures. I am still a creature. We still owe God worship because he is God. And we certainly love him, uh, well, we certainly owe him our love and devotion for what he has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thirdly, what about our need to get together in worship? Again, the idea of a common day. Are, are we free just to set whatever day we want to and say this is going to be our day of rest? Or has God actually set a day for us so that we would all have the same day, so that we would be able to keep the commandment that he gives us in the New Testament, which is not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. We can only do this, we can only fulfill this commandment if we do have a day off that is in common, but that's exactly what the Lord gives us by giving us that day. So the need for rest hasn't changed, the need for worship hasn't changed, and the need for us to gather together as a body of Christ for worship hasn't changed. Now, fourthly, the Lord actually told us in the Old Covenant, before the New Covenant came, that the Sabbath would continue even once the New Covenant came. So looking ahead to the blessings of the New Covenant, the Lord actually pronounces a blessing upon two groups of, of people who would be able to enter into the assembly of God which in the Old Covenant they couldn't, and, uh, well, the two groups are basically in, in this, uh, well, the, the foreigners, you know, the, all, it, was, it was Israel only, but the Gentiles were going to be brought in, and those that were called eunuchs, you know, if, if a person was a eunuch, 
they were not able to enter into the assembly of the Lord. They were actually excluded from it. So we know from this text that the Lord is actually looking forward to the time when those barriers would be broken down. And he says when that takes place, that these who are in these categories who keep the Sabbath will actually be blessed of the Lord. Let me read that uh, in Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 7. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Now again, the Lord here is describing the blessings of the new covenant in terms of the old covenant, but he is talking about the new covenant dispensation, and he says in that time that these who keep my Sabbaths will be blessed. The Lord is talking about the continuance of it. The psalmist writes in our call to worship in Psalm 118, that the day of our Lord's resurrection would be a day of rejoicing for God's people. Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So in the old covenant, looking forward to, again, the, the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ and entering into his rest, that day would be a day of rejoicing for the people of God. Now, fifthly, our Lord defended the Sabbath and what may or may not be done on the Sabbath when his disciples were accused of breaking the Sabbath uh, by the Pharisees. Remember, they were picking the heads of grain and they were eating on the Lord's day. They said, your disciples are doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But our Lord defends them and says it was appropriate to do works of necessity. He also challenged them. He said, which one among you, if his donkey fell into a ditch, wouldn't lift him out on the Sabbath? He says it is, it is appropriate to do works of necessity and works of mercy on the Sabbath day. And he even declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, the argument that's often used to show that the Sabbath, or at least to try to prove the Sabbath doesn't continue, is the idea that the Lord doesn't talk about it in the New Testament. And yet, our Lord probably spoke about that more than just about anything else in the New Covenant, even declaring himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And after giving this instruction as a part of the rest of his instruction that he gave to his people, when it came time for the Great Commission, he told them to go out and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe, he says, all or everything that I have commanded you. Well, that includes, of course, what he was teaching regarding the Sabbath and the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. A sixth argument comes from what we already saw in the book of Hebrews, that there is a Sabbath rest that continues for the people of God because the one who has entered into his rest has rested from his works as God did from his. That is talking about the fact that, that the keeping of the Sabbath remains because the possibility of entering into heavenly rest still remains through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much, you know, that is in that one particular text. The only reason why you or I or anyone else will ever enter into heaven is because of what Jesus Christ has done. You know that he lived the perfect life. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. And after those so many days, he, he did enter into heaven. The day of his resurrection, when the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone, that is when he entered into his rest. 
And because he has done that, we will have the opportunity of entering into heaven or into that rest. The Sabbath day remains or continues because the possibility of entering into that rest remains if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the only way we can enter into that rest. So basically, that is the work of the new creation. Even as our Lord originally made all things in six days and rested on the seventh day, our Lord Jesus comes into the world. He does the work of the new creation in his earthly ministry. He dies on the cross. He is raised again from the dead. That day is to commemorate the, the end, as it were, the work of the new creation. And we are to observe the Sabbath based upon that rest of our Lord Jesus Christ rather than the rest at the end of the original creation week. It's based upon the work of redemption. And Jesus, by giving to us this day and continuing this day, reminds us that there is still the possibility of entering into heaven if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to pursue it by faith. We have to trust him. And then finally, let me just give you one last argument, and that is that the Sabbath, the keeping of the Sabbath remains because as we've already seen. The Ten Commandments are still in force. Our Lord tells us that. We, that's something we saw a few weeks ago. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, do you think Jesus by this was teaching the abrogation of the fourth commandment? Is it gone? Is it fulfilled? Is it, is it passed away? No, the Lord is saying, if you annul even one of the least of the commandments and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom. But if you keep and teach them, you should be called great in the kingdom. And then again, the reminder, your righteousness needs to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven at all. You must not only trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but have that evidence in your life that you truly are a Christian by living a life that, that surpasses that which the scribes and Pharisees lived. I mean, theirs was purely hypocritical. They kept things, the law of God outwardly, but not from the heart. You need to have that new heart. You need to keep the commandments of God from the heart if you are to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that every Christian will be able to do by the grace of God. Again, we don't keep the commandments to enter the kingdom of heaven. We keep them because he has changed our hearts and has made us the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. So the Lord created the Sabbath day to be a day of rest and to be a, a day of worship that would be common to each one of us. And since we are still in need of both rest and worship, he gives us this day as a blessing to our souls. Now finally, how should you honor the Lord on this day? Well, I believe that the commandment tells us what it is we are supposed to do. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How are we to honor the Lord on this day? We are to keep this day holy. Now, holy means that you are to set this day aside from common use or what you would do on the other six days and that you are to set it aside for the Lord's use. Now, I've already told you that the Lord gives us six days to take care of our needs to do all of our work that's necessary to take care of our bodies. But he gives us the seventh day to take care of our souls because we need that time with the Lord. We need that worship. We need to use these means that God gives to us to build us up. Now, let me just make one more note regarding this command because this is important. If we're going to keep this day holy, we do, do need to know which day that is. 
Now, the commandment itself does not really tell us. There's another group of, of believers who believe that to keep this commandment, we have to keep the seventh day of the week holy. But I want you to see that this commandment does not say that it's the seventh day of the week. It simply says work six days and rest on the seventh because God worked six days and rested on the seventh. And yes, originally it was to commemorate the old creation. And originally it was the seventh day of the week. But the commandment itself does not tell us which day of the week. It simply tells us how long we are to devote to the Lord and how often we are to devote you know, what it, that length of time to Him. Now, the length of time is a day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the frequency is one day and seven. Work six days and rest on the seventh. Now, as far as where the cycle begins and ends and so forth, the Lord has to show us outside of the commandment what those days actually are. Now, in the Old Covenant, as I said, it was commemorating the, the end of the creation week, and so the people of God observed the seventh day of the week. Uh, we do see that they were taken into captivity and were there for over 400 years, and during that time they were not able to observe their Sabbaths, and as soon as the Lord brought them out, He reestablished the Sabbath based upon His redemption of them out of Egypt rather than the original creation week, so he again resets the clock, but this time based upon redemption from Egypt. Well, in the New Covenant, the Lord resets the clock again and bases it upon the time his son enters into his rest. This is the day which the Lord has made, the day in which the stone which the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Sabbath rest remains because... Uh, he entered into his rest and rested from his works as God did from his. The early church shows us that this is the day they understood as the day which the Lord would have them to worship on the day of Christ's resurrection, the day to observe this Sabbath. Acts 20, verse 7, Luke, Luke writes this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. When were they meeting together for worship? On the first day of the week. What were they doing? Well, Paul was preaching, and they were celebrating the Lord's Supper. They were meeting together for worship. So the first day of the week is the day we observe. It's based upon the work of redemption, on the work of Christ, on the work of the new creation, rather than the work of the old creation. So that is the day that we are to keep holy. So how are we to keep this day holy? Well, first of all, we are to set it aside from the other days of the week by leaving certain things out of the day, uh, things that we have to leave out so that we'll be able to do what the Lord actually calls us to do, which is to rest and to worship. Now, as I give you these principles, remember that there are some exceptions. So what are we to leave out? Well, first of all, uh, simply put, again, anything that doesn't have to do with what the Lord has called us to do on this day, which is rest and worship. The first thing we have to exclude, of course, is work. Uh, we're told in the commandment itself, in it, that is, in the Sabbath day, you shall not do any work. Uh, this day is to be a day of rest so that you may worship. And it is to be a day of rest and worship for everyone and not just for you. By the way, I do believe that that means, and I need, I, need to be, I need to qualify this a little bit, but since this is to be a common day for all of God's creatures and for mankind to rest and to worship, we need to make sure that we don't cause other people to work on that day either, uh, to do unnecessary work. I'm gonna get to that in just a minute. But this is what it says in the commandment. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Notice the cattle, they're not supposed to be working either. Everyone and everything is to be resting. But now when we, we make other people work for us and do unnecessary work, then they are becoming a servant to us. We don't have full-time servants, we have part-time servants, and they serve us whenever we go somewhere and buy something. 
the Lord would have us not to make other people do unnecessary work. I have to kind of jump ahead here to explain this, but there are necessary works that people do have to do for us. And those things can continue on this day. If you're traveling and you need to eat, there's people who can serve you in the restaurant. There's people who can help you in the hotel. There's people who have to be working to keep the lights on and to preserve property and to preserve life and so forth. Those things are necessary, but not unnecessary work. We should never make people do unnecessary work, and we shouldn't do unnecessary work. So that's one thing we need to leave out of the day is work. The second thing the Lord tells us to leave out of the day is recreations that take our minds away from the Lord and draw them into the world. I know this is going to step on, on, it would step on a lot of toes today, but the Lord's Day is not a day to play football or to play baseball or to play other sports. It's not a day to go to those events to watch them. It's not a day to watch them on television or to watch movies and TV programs and so forth because if we do that, we're not really separating the day apart from the other six days and devoting it to the Lord, we're devoting it to ourselves to do what we would do on the other six days. Remember that we're resting so that we can worship, so that we can spend the day with God. And we can't really spend the day with God if we're involved in other things, just simply trying to please ourselves. And I, I'm going to mention at the end, the thing that should be most pleasing to us is being able to spend the day with God. So how can you keep the day holy to the Lord if you let these things intrude? How can you keep the day holy to the Lord if, okay, let's say you, you don't go to those events, but it fills your conversation? And that's all you talk about are, are sports and TV programs and movies or, or even work. Now, the Lord gives us an incentive in his word. He promises a, a blessing to us if we are willing to set these things aside and truly honor him on this day. Isaiah 58, verses 13 through 14, listen to what he says. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now notice the Lord is not telling us here that it's always wrong to be seeking our pleasure, although I think we should always be seeking it in the Lord, but on his day, it's, it's different. We are not to be seeking our own pleasure on this day except the pleasure that we find in him. And again, that should be our greatest pleasure, to be able to spend the day with him. But he has to give us a commandment like this because you know as well as I do our tendencies as far as what we, we like to do. You know, we like to pleasure ourselves. But we need to find that pleasure in the Lord and that's one of the reasons why he gives us this day, is so that we can learn to do that. So these are the things you need to rest from, work and recreations. And by the way, there are recreations that would actually draw you closer to the Lord, maybe getting out and looking at the creation and seeing how great God is. And you don't want to go too far because you want to be able to get together for worship and fellowship with God's people. But there are places you can get out to that aren't too far away where you can see the Lord in his creation and actually be refreshed and draw nearer to him. But that wouldn't include the things that are contact sports that, that wear you out and don't focus you on the Lord. So resting from these things in order to spend the day with him in worship and fellowship for the good of your soul, ultimately, that you might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that you might actually advance the kingdom of heaven. Now, we might actually look at this day as a picture of heaven because this is what we're going to be doing in heaven, isn't it? We're going to be resting from our works. We're no longer going to be engaged in work. Heaven is called rest. The, you know, we uh, strive to enter that rest, uh, the author to the Hebrews says. The possibility of entering that rest exists. So there is rest in heaven, rest from our labors. In heaven, we're not going to be playing sports. 
We're not going to be playing video games and watching movies. Uh, we're, we're going to, uh, you know, be worshiping the Lord. This is a picture of heaven. And so, as a picture of heaven, we might say that uh, this day is also a test for us. Perhaps a test of our sanctification. I mean, can you, can you really enjoy a day like this? When you separate yourself from the things that you really enjoy doing in this world, do you like this kind of a day? A day when you actually spend it, a day with the Lord. Now, what happens if you, you don't like a day like this? I mean, what does that say about, about your heart? And what does it say about the prospect of spending the rest of eternity with God? Because that's the way it's going to be. No television, no video games, no sports. It's going to be just you and the Lord and the people of God in fellowship. If you don't like it here, are you going to like it up there? You see, the, the Lord's Day, the, the Sabbath, also tells us something about our own hearts and how much you really love the Lord and what it is you really want to do. And in that sense, it's also a day that can increase your sanctification because setting everything else aside to seek the Lord is going to cause you to grow spiritually, isn't it? It's going to cause you to grow in your love for the Lord. And as, as that takes place, you're going to be better equipped to serve the Lord, and you're actually going to love this day even more. Now, I do want to say that, that having said all of that, this day is a day of rest and worship, and it's meant to be a blessing to us and so forth, so we need to leave these various things out so that we can focus on the Lord. We do need to bear in mind, too, that the Lord does not intend this day to injure you in any way. It doesn't, it's not meant to hurt us or to hurt others, which is why the Lord tells us there are certain things we can do on this day and that we ought to do. We actually already looked at a couple of those. If there's something we need to do to protect life or property on this day, we need to do it. That's the reason why there's a person you know, who's working right now to keep our lights on. That's the reason why there are people working in restaurants to help travelers, although they're helping other people who don't need help. There are people who do need help. And so they're laboring to help them. The Lord does not give us this day to destroy life or to destroy property. Jesus, ourself healed, uh, or Jesus, our Lord, healed a man on the Sabbath who had a withered hand. And he showed us that it's appropriate to help other people on the Lord's day. We don't just pass by people who need help because it's the Lord's day and we can't do any work. Works of mercy are allowed. Works of necessity are allowed. The disciples picked grain and they ate it while traveling. That was something the Pharisees said, they're doing that which is unlawful to do on the Lord's day. But the Lord said, no, they can do it because they're traveling, because it's necessary, because it's, it's necessary to preserve their lives. If we're going through difficult times in, in our work, in our lives, it's, it's appropriate to share that. I mean, we can talk about that and pray for one another. The Lord doesn't intend to shut that down on the Lord's day. We need to talk about those things and pray for those things. Now, there are things that we are not to do that will interfere with, with the great purpose that God has for this particular day, but there are things that we may do to protect our lives and the lives of others. The Lord does not intend this day to destroy us. He intends this day to be a blessing to us. Now, getting back to the original subject, if you have been redeemed by the Lord, if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, turning from your sins, this is what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to keep this day because Jesus kept this day. You're going to want to keep this day because that's what God requires of you. You're going to want to keep this day because it's your nature to want to keep this day. And this is the definition of love. Remember, keeping the commandments. These commandments simply tell us what it means to love. And this is one way in which you love the Lord. And so if you are, want to show your love to him, you need to keep the Sabbath holy. I mean, God says to you, I want you to set this day aside and I want you to spend it with me. And you say, no thanks, Lord, I'd rather do this. That isn't showing God love, is it? It's not putting him first. There are so few Christians today 
who actually do this. Let's make sure, or actually, you know, actually keep this day holy. Let's make sure that we don't follow that example. Now, granted that perhaps a majority of broad evangelical churches are not keeping the Sabbath, and the reason is because they, they tend not to believe that it continues. And again, I'm sort of a strange thing because they say Jesus doesn't speak about it, but as a matter of fact, he declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. What more could he say about the continuance of the Sabbath? But they believe that and they teach others and there's a lot of people who are doing or not keeping the Sabbath because they're being taught not to keep the Sabbath. I do think that the Lord is patient you know, with them and he understands what it is they're hearing, what it is they're receiving and not receiving. And so he is being gracious. But let's make sure that we understand that patience is not the same thing as approval. The Lord isn't saying, well, you're not keeping it, that's okay. What he's saying is, you're not keeping it, you should be keeping it, but I understand it's because you're teachers you're not keeping it, you're not being taught to keep it, and so I'm going to work with you, I'm going to be patient as I lead you to this truth. If you know that this is what the Lord would have you to do, and you're convinced from Scripture that that's what he calls you to do, well, then you, you're, you're called to keep this day. There, there's sort of a higher level of responsibility. When you know what the Lord wants you to do, you're responsible to do it. I think the Lord is patient with the others because they just don't understand that that's what they need to be doing. It is the Lord's will, as we've already seen, that we keep this day and honor Him. Now let me just close by saying this, and, and this is another test of where our hearts are at. Even if it were true that the Sabbath no longer was binding, wouldn't it really be the case if you love the Lord that you would wish that this commandment continue? Think about that for a second. Let's say that there was no longer Sabbath day. You no longer had to rest and worship the Lord. If you were a true believer, wouldn't you desire to do that still, though, even if the commandment didn't exist? Isn't that something you would want to have a day like this, a day where the Lord actually commands you not to work? so that you can spend the day with, with Him? I really think if you love the Lord, if we, if we really loved Him the way that we should, we, we shouldn't look at the Sabbath and say, this day's kind of a bummer because I can't do all these other things I want to do. I can't watch television. I can't play video games. I can't go to the sporting event. I can't go to the beach and all these things that I can't do. And I can't work on my house and I can't fix this and I can't fix that and so forth. If we really love the Lord, we would say instead, you know what, I love this day and I wish every day were like this. And I can't wait until the time when I actually get to leave this world and enter into the eternal Sabbath where every day is going to be just like this, but only better because I'm actually going to be with the Lord. You see, that is the heart of a person who has the new nature They've, they've been recreated into the image of Jesus Christ because this was his heart. This is what he wanted. And if we are believers, we must have something of that desire in ourselves. So even though we will find because of the sin in us some of that aversion to that day, we should still find within our souls a real desire for this, a real desire for the Sabbath so that we can, by God's commandment, Set aside those things. I mean, we have warned by God to say, I'm not going to do that today so that I can spend the day with Him. That is what we should be finding in our hearts. If that's what is in your heart, then you can know that you're a true believer. But if you don't find any of that in your heart, then you, you really need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because that's the only way you're going to get that grace to love the Lord in this way. So if you don't have the desire for the Sabbath day, ask that the Lord might grant it to you because there is nothing but good on this day. It's a day we can spend with Him. Pray that He would give you that grace, give you the grace to turn from your sins and to trust in Him. But may the Lord grant it to all of us uh, that grace to be able to desire Him in that way and to want to spend the entire day with Him. Let's close um, our eyes and spend just a few moments in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord 
to um, well, give us that desire and strengthen that desire and also ask him to forgive us for the times when we have uh, felt otherwise about that day.